We had witnesses from the Doctors for Protection of gun, from Guns. They said they had strong evidence. They said they would provide it to committee. They haven't provided that evidence to committee yet. Uh, they ranked my studies actually as the highest uh, ranking studies within their review. Um, we've had a number of witnesses that have come before the committee from the sporting, sports shooting, various sports shooting disciplines. I'm concerned that this legislation is not going to exempt their sports. Um, we've had other witnesses who've come in and said we can't allow these sport, we cannot allow these sports to be exempted because it's a threat to public safety. Does your research indicate that if if uh, would you conclude that an expansion of an exemption allowing IPSC or uh, mounted shooter clubs uh, will in any way have a negative impact on public safety? Uh, like I said before, over 550,000 firearms were banned, Mo many of them handguns, short barrel handguns in the 1990s, and there was no associated benefit from that. So I don't see allowing a s relatively small, tiny group of users to have handguns would have any effect, especially when recent uh, reports have shown that about 85% of handguns used in, in crimes are imported from the United States illegally. Now, uh, you know, kind of jumping on that, we had uh, Mr. Langua here talking about the prevalence of ghost guns, which is something we're very concerned about. Um, it feels like traditional approaches to constrict the supply of, of guns. Uh, I think C21 is definitely a traditional approach. Uh, given the reality of ghost guns, uh, do you think that C21 will actually be effective in any way at uh, reducing gun violence in Canada? I don't think so at all. I mean, the the problem with a lot of the studies that are performed is, is that there are so many substitute methods for obtaining firearms. Even U.S. studies, uh, the ease and ability to transfer firearms across borders through various states makes a lot of those studies um, somewhat inconclusive as well. So I, I can't see this having any any benefit at all. Um, earlier in the study, we had witnesses from the Doctors for Protection of gun, from Guns, and they claimed that uh, C21 and other similar gun control policies will significantly reduce the overall rate of suicide in Canada. They said they had strong evidence. They said they would provide it to committee. Um, I just reviewed this morning. They haven't provided that evidence to committee yet. Other than, other than your work in the Canadian context, I haven't seen any peer-reviewed study to suggest that this kind of legislation will reduce overall suicides. Um, are you aware of any evidence that uh, in the Canadian that suggests otherwise? So for Canada particularly, uh, no. Um, a recent uh, Canadian Medical Association Journal uh, article came out showing that while suicides do uh, seem to go down in association with gun legislation, overall suicide stays the same. Uh, they ranked my studies actually as the highest uh, ranking studies within their review. Um, other studies from Australia have also shown that while overall suicide rates, sorry, while firearm suicide rates may decrease, overall suicide rates don't change. There's multiple studies involved, and I've submitted those in my brief to this uh, committee. Uh, the ease and ability of hanging, uh, hanging is 80% as effective uh, at, at suicide, similar to firearms. Um, when someone has uh, serious intent, it's almost impossible to deter them. Unfortunately, as physicians, we even have no clinical decision rules or ability to really predict who's going to commit suicide. I would strongly suggest that, I mean, when I see a patient and, we, and they own firearms and we discuss risk reduction, and that means either the CFO removing the firearms or them giving them to their friends, uh, my, the, the, the second thing I can give them is a, is a referral to psychiatry about eight months later. Mm. Uh, that's yeah, and that's like something insult. that you mentioned, you know, we're talking about with C21 and with the the gun buyback that the government's contemplating potentially in the billions of dollars. Um, do you think that money would be far better spent on addressing the mental health challenges that are coming in Canada? Would that actually have a greater effect on reducing suicide, reducing domestic abuse and reducing overall gun crime in this country? It, it would have a far greater effect. Um, I've been coming here for 10 years. People have said to me that they are increasing funding, but so far our wait lists have increased, especially mm -hmm. over the last two years. Um, finally, I guess uh, we've had some witnesses who said they use single action revolvers for their sports. We have people who use black powder, uh, muzzle loaded, like basically like pistols from like the 18th and 17th centuries. Um, these are all being considered handguns under this legislation. 
Does your research indicate that those kinds of handguns are far less uh, likely to be used by criminals? Uh, my research doesn't look into that, but other research has looked into what criminals prefer. Um, they typically do prefer the firearms with ejectable magazines, um, and that has changed over the years. Um, previously, they did uh, use revolvers. Uh, restrictions in D.C. And, and other places in the United States, restrictions in Australia, there's been no associated benefit in terms of reduction of homicide. So we know there's already a very low likelihood that a licensed handgun owner is going to commit a crime. But would you say it's fair to say there's an even far lower likelihood that somebody who uses like a muzzle loaded black powder firearm or a single action revolver is at even lower risk of being a public safety risk? Would you say that's the would you conclude that to be the case? I would suspect that's the case. I don't have evidence for that, but I would I would I would strongly doubt it. Thank you. Okay.